I think, you know, we put so much time and and our hearts and our souls into our music and and uh, our music is like uh, like having a child, you know, and would you put your child in the hands of a stranger just, uh. just because, you know, he's promising to take good care? I know. I mean, you would really check that person out. Welcome to the Female Entrepreneur Musician Podcast with Bree Noble. Bree is a musician, entrepreneur, speaker, and founder of Women of Substance Music Radio and Podcast. Bree's interviews with successful female musicians and industry pros are both inspirational and informational. She also answers your questions about the music business. Bree is on a mission to help you create great music, connect with your fans, and grow your business, and to truly become a female entrepreneur musician. Hey, this is Brie Noble, and I want to thank you for tuning in to the Female Entrepreneur Musician Podcast, where we talk about making great music, connecting with our audience, and growing our business. And man, there is so much going on over at femusician.com. I just want to encourage you to go over there and check out all the new blog posts, all the new podcast episode, the new quiz we've got going on. There's just so many things that you can do and learn over at femusician.com. So go check it out. Now I want to get to our show today because I'm really excited about this episode with Nancy Ruth. Here's a little bit of information about her. Nancy Ruth is a Canadian-born singer-songwriter, musician, and recording artist. From accompanying herself on piano and guitar to fronting bands and headlining on the concert stage, Nancy has enjoyed an international performance career that has explored genres as diverse as jazz, rock, Broadway, Latin, and flamenco. Her Spanish roots eventually led her to Malaga, Spain, where she now resides, and finds creative inspiration for her songwriting, weaving her influences in the Mediterranean breeze. Here's my interview with Nancy Ruth. That's a little bit about Nancy Ruth. So Nancy, can you give us some information about you that maybe isn't in your the little bio that I just read that maybe might be interesting for our listeners? You might uh, have um, guessed it uh, just because I've been around for, for quite a while, but I started out in the music business before they had uh, computers, you know, before we had computers, before there was internet, um, we were using cassette tape. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I've am I'm been around for a while and I, I've seen how the music business has changed so much. So um, that's given me a real perspective and, and, and also taught me a lot about... Uh, um, really good business skills, you know, right from the beginning. That's, yeah, that's great. And obviously you have a lot of experience. So, I mean, we'll get into this a little bit more later, but I'm just curious, the first album you recorded, was it actually on cassette tape? Yes, it or? was. And, and, <laughs> and, and thank God cassettes are not used anymore. <laughs> I know, I know. I, when I was in college, I recorded an, al- an album with a group I was in and it was cassette tape too. And oh, wow. I've, you know, we immediate, like within five years, CDs, you could record things on CD. And so I like got it onto CD right away and, and digitized it because I thought this is not going to last. <laughs> yeah. <You know? laughs> okay. So let's find out a little bit about how you got into music. It was very, very much from a young age. I, I, uh, my grandfather taught me how to play the ukulele and uh, I used to mm. sing jazz standards on the ukulele sitting on the dock where I was, uh, I, I was growing up, uh, uh, on the west coast of, of British Columbia in Sydney, British Columbia, small town. And I would just sit on the dock and play the ukulele. And, and one day somebody came in and, and threw some money in the ukulele case. And I thought, well, this is a good way to make a living. So <laughs> that was the first time. But um, but many years later, technically speaking, um, I was uh, about about 20 years old and um, and uh, I was studying music uh, in, in New Westminster, British Columbia. And um, I had made a demo with some friends just and very naively went around to recording studios looking for work and and thought well maybe I could get some work singing jingles or something I didn't know anything but um there was a producer who was nice enough to listen to the tape and and just by some synchronicity there was a band recording at that studio that day and they heard the tape and they said we're looking for a singer. Do you want to come out and audition? And I said, yeah. So I went and auditioned and, uh, and got the gig and went on the road two weeks later and pretty much never looked back. So that's how it started. 
That's crazy. I mean, you hear these stories about people that go from studio to studio trying to get people to listen to their demo. And, you know, most of the time nothing comes of it, but you never know, right? Yeah. Well, I was just young and completely uh, ignorant of the business. I, I didn't know anything. I, I just sometimes, you know, when you're like that, though, you just enthusiastically go somewhere. Um, people will pay attention to you. So it was a bit of luck, I suppose. That's true. Sometimes that naivete is, you know, it's it's a little bit intriguing to people. So yeah. and, and obviously the enthusiasm. I definitely wouldn't have the enthusiasm at my age now to do that. But, you know, it's it's great that when you do, you take advantage of that because you never know what will happen. Absolutely. So right now, do you consider yourself a full time musician? And, you know, by that, I mean, are you making your entire income from music or are you um, supplementing with, you know, teaching or anything else that you're doing? Well, I've actually made my living solely, pretty much solely from music for almost 30 years, believe it or not. Wow. Um, I've never had a plan B. And so I think because of necessity, I've, I've always kept, kept working. Um, when I was first starting out, uh, there were a few gaps in my schedule, obviously just, you know, learning and making contacts. And I did a bit of waitress, waitressing when I was, when I was young. And, um, I do teach from time to time, mostly because I enjoy it and uh, I find it really rewarding and, uh, you know, I, I do, I don't teach uh, full time or even part time, but just the odd class. Um, but 90% um, of my income comes from performances, from live performances. And uh, maybe the other 10 just from, you know, sales, CD sales, uh, a little bit of licensing and, and odd things like that, um, depending on the moment. But yeah, no, that's all I've ever done. And um, it's, uh, <laughs> it's just you, you get used to the living in this sort of realm of uncertainty, because you never really know when the next gig is going to be. I mean, you might know six months ahead or even a year ahead, but um, I'm still hanging in there, still, still doing it. That's amazing. So since you perform 90% of the time or your 90% of your income is from performances, do you include the CD sales from those performances in that or is that the 10%? Uh, no, that would be the 10%. Okay. Uh, do you yeah. find that people are still buying CDs at, at live performances? Not so much anymore. I used to sell a lot. Um, it used to be great, you know, like two people would buy a CD and then the, and the five more people would come and then like there'd be a lineup, you know, people just like, oh yeah, let's get a CD. And um, that was even up until maybe 10 years ago. But since then people are like, oh, you know, yeah, they buy them. Um, but not, it's, you know, I just released a new CD and I'm not even a hundred percent sure if I'm going to make physical copies yet. I, I should probably, mm. but it's, I'm on the fence about it. Do you find that there's other merch that people like to buy? And then sometimes if you, you know, combine them into some kind of a combo pack that they're more likely to buy, like maybe t-shirts or mugs or I've anything. Never, that you I've sell? never done t-shirts or mugs. I, I've never really uh, gotten organized to do that. I don't know. I, I, I feel like, uh, I feel silly having my name on a t-shirt for some reason. I maybe. hear that so many <laughs> times, you know, I always say, well, maybe put your album name or, yeah. you know, your tagline or something. If you feel weird having your name or your yeah. picture on a t-shirt, which I can totally get. Cause I would feel weird about that too. I, have a I really, went through that. I have a really cool design for the new CD and I was thinking about making t-shirts and I have a, um, a Scandinavian tour pending for the spring of next year. So I think if that tour comes through, I might make t-shirts just because the, the design is so cool. Um, so maybe if it was a t-shirt that I would wear, I might do it, but I just, yeah, it's certainly something to uh, consider, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. If it's a t-shirt you would wear, I, I'm sure someone would wear it. Yeah. So we have a lot of struggling musicians that listen to this show, maybe people that are just starting out. And I think they could really benefit from hearing a story or two from you kind of, you know, from the, the beginning years, maybe some time that you felt like, oh my gosh, is this thing really going to work out? Maybe you feel like you hit a wall and you just didn't know, you know, where to go next and if this was really going to pan out or not and how you got through that and what you learned from it. I think the, the first thing you have to really get clear about is, is, are you a musician? I mean, were you born to do this? Is this, is this just it? You just have to be so clear about it. And, and in my case, there was just, there was just no doubt. I just did it and, and I'm still doing it. And I can't even imagine um, doing anything else. Although it is sort of in the back of my mind because I just turned 50 that, wow, you know, I mean, 
you know, I have to think about what am I going to do when I'm 60 and 70? Hopefully I'll still be doing, um, still be performing, you know, as much as I can, but yeah, you, you'll be like <laughs> Tony Bennett and still performing at 80. I hope so. I, I really do. I mean, I, I think, um, older musicians just have so much more to, uh, to, uh, well, something different perhaps to offer, but, uh, you just have to be completely clear about uh, this is who you are and, and not be, um, performing or, or being a musician for any other reason other than, you know, this is who you are and be brave enough to find your own voice. And that is a process. And, uh, also something very important. Um, one of the lessons that I've learned, uh, is to take the time when you're young, if you can, to get a good musical education, because I, I started, as I said, I, I did have a good classical background. Um, I had studied um, classical voice and piano, but I really wanted to have jazz harmony and, and jazz chops under my belt. And um, I was kind of in a hurry just to get performing and to make it and to do it and, and get out there and, and get recognized, you know, when I was um, in my early 20s. And uh, I didn't take the time out to finish the education that I really wanted to do. And really, you know, with the years, as the years go by, you, you know, when you have those knowledge gaps, they really kind of kick you in the butt, you know. And, and so um, if you can get a really good education, oh, man, it is just such a such an advantage to be able to really communicate with other musicians on, on a high level and be able to work with musicians that are on a high, higher level, you know, um, it's just so satisfying. So I would really recommend getting a good education if you can. That being said, there are plenty of musicians that are just, you know, can play circles around uh, me or, or, or many of us that have not really found their own thing, you know. So that comes back to being clear on why you are doing what you're doing. Why do you really feel like you have something to say and you have a real intrinsic need to express yourself through your instrument? And, and, um, you know, do you have kind of the patience and the discipline and the, and the, the desire and the th enthusiasm to, to follow that path wherever it takes you, because it's, it's a bit of an unknown path. It's exciting, but you have to be brave. I think that's such a good point. I mean, I always tell my students, you need to know why you're doing this, because if you don't, then you're not going to have that internal thing that drives you, yes. you know, and when you hit a wall, you're going to give up because you're like, you just don't have this push Absolutely. you know, behind what you're doing. That's so true. And, yeah. you know, they just, you need to know, like, what are your core values and, and, you know, what is it you want to get out of this? And you know what, if it is to be famous, that's okay, but you need to be honest with yourself. Like, is that why you're doing this? Are you doing this because you have, you've something to give to the world or, you know, you just, you need to be honest with yourself about why you're doing music and, you know, and that will change too. Like maybe when you're younger, it's all about, you want to be famous. And then when you get older, you know, it's more about, it's the passion behind it. If you're in it to be famous, you might um, enjoy that for a little while, but you probably won't last for very long. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, I'm talking about roadblocks and, and as you were saying, to have that internal drive to be able to come or overcome the obstacles uh, because the music business is extremely challenging. It's very difficult. There are a lot of, um, uh, just a lot of shit. <laughs> Yeah, let's just say with. it like, tell it like it is. All right. You just gotta, gotta deal with a lot of crap. Um, and you really have to have uh, the enthusiasm and the desire to, to do what you do so much that that crap does not get you down, you know, and just to keep, keep on going through. So, so, so important. And I like what you said about education too. That is always one of those double-edged swords because you know, some people think, well, I don't need to go to school. I just need to jump out in the world and, and get in there in the trenches and start doing it. And sometimes that's true because sometimes we go and get, I mean, I have a degree in music and they taught me zero about how to actually get into the music business, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So there's this kind of this two sides of you need to learn your music theory and be able to talk music with people on a high level, like you said, because it's so important when you're in the studio to be able to have a real conversation with musicians. I think, yeah, it, it's a tricky subject because um, music education depends on, depending on where you do it, it can be kind of um, anti, I don't want to even say this, but it, if, 
you can kind of get into the um, intellectual trap of like, oh, yes, I know all my harmony and I can play really fast. Um, and so, you know, that's great. But as I said, it's it's a two tiered thing. You know, one is the education and the other one is the creative path. And you have to have both and they both supplement each other. But um, in my case, the creative path was so clear. So the, the education was just um, uh, sort of uh, resources and tools, you know, to help me express that. And if I had not had the musical education that I did have and the desire to continue it, which I eventually did, um, going to Berkeley um, online, I really wanted to go to Berkeley. And uh, actually, I could tell you about that later. But um, but my the education that I do have is why I can make a living playing music exclusively. And it is only because of that, because it has um, given me the opportunity to do many things. So um, I work as a soloist sometimes, accompanying myself at the piano. I can work as a pianist. I can work as a singer, a session singer. I play the guitar and uh, I can write my own charts out. I don't have to hire somebody. And, you know, it, it gives you a tremendous amount of confidence to be able to write a song Um say, hey, here's a way that I can improve the harmonic structure of the song and then write out your own chord chart, hire your own musicians, make call the shots and say, okay, we're going to have a rehearsal and this is how we're going to, how we're going to do it. And, and um, it gives you a tremendous amount of confidence and, and, and then people are more keen to hire you and they're more keen to work with you and, and things are going to go better and they're going to hire you back. And these are just sort of longevity tools to keep you working. For sure. It gives you that versatility, but it also, you know, makes you be able to be a manager of your own business. Yeah. Absolutely. Instead of having yeah. to, you know, just be a player that maybe someone else, you know, is, is kind of calling the shots. You can really call the shots. Yeah. When you, when you're an artist and, and I know your, your podcast and your, your whole, your radio is about, you know, entrepreneurial musicians that, that are, you know, cr creators. And then supporting their creative life by with the business part of it. So the the business tools are important and uh, we're always trying to keep up with the changing times of the digital world. But those basic musicianship qualities sometimes get overlooked and will often get overlooked, um, especially with singers. And, and I'm a singer, so I, I can say that. Um, and so it's really important, I think, uh, for me, it's been really important. I'm, I'm happy to have those skills and I'm always working on them. So what do you think makes you unique as a musician? Uh, I think, well, first of all, my music is very difficult to define. You know, whenever I, 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 you know, you have to check the little boxes like, okay, what category is it? Latin? Is it jazz? Is it pop? Is it rap? Is it, is it blues? It doesn't, it like, it doesn't fit into any of those categories. So that is my greatest uh, advantage and my greatest challenge, I think, because I, my influences are jazz, uh, flamenco, Latin, world music. Also, I love my Led Zeppelin, you know, I mean, I'm a big <laughs> rock star. <laughs> I grew up in the 70s, so I love all that stuff. 70s rock. So um, very, I, my sound is very unique, um, which makes it very difficult to market. I just, I, I just went to the Latin music, the Billboard Music Conference in, in Miami last month. Mm. And uh, it was the, uh, the Latin, the Billboard Latin Music Conference. And I thought, okay, you know, this could kind of fit in here, but I realized it doesn't even fit in the Latin music uh, category. Um, Oh, and I've got some stuff to tell you about the Billboard conference if you want later. It was really interesting. So um, that makes me unique. And I, I guess the other thing is, is that I've, I've always kind of gone against um, a lot of advice that I've gotten and for my instincts. You know, I, I when I was uh, starting out, I had a, a producer who was saying, you know, Nancy, you should really get into country music because country music is going to be huge. And you've got a great voice for country. And, and I said, yeah, but I'm not a country singer. That's not my thing, you know. And I I, I don't know. I want to go to Spain. And and then I, I went to Spain and I came back with all these songs. And I went to another producer and he said, you know, Nancy, you're never going to get anywhere as long as you keep going to Spain. you got to stay in North America. you got to stay in Vancouver. you got to stick around. And I'm like, no, but this is my thing, you know. I don't know what it's all about, but i got to follow my my instincts. So I think I, I've just always been uh, one to follow my own instincts, even though it might not be um, the most commercially viable thing at the moment. But um, but it does feel good to just 
do what's true to yourself, even if there's no great explanation for it. Totally. So what was your driving factor behind going to Spain? It was instinct. Uh, ever since I was a kid, I was fascinated by by anything that sounded Spanish. Um, the Phrygian scale, for those of us that know music, that, <laughs> da, 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 you know, that the, the actual harmonic structure of flamenco music was just always so interesting to me. Um, I have Spanish blood going back, but... Um, but I don't know. I, I when I got here, I just I was so glad that I came, and um, I didn't have uh, internet. I didn't have a phone. I just listened to uh, the waves and and kind of tapped into my creative uh, vibe. And uh, it's really when I started to find my my own voice, you know, because up until then I had been. I'd been touring a lot, but I was, you know, singing in all kinds of different bands and jazz trios and, you know, it was great experience and learning, but I think I didn't really find my own voice until I, until I got to Spain. So it was just such a great feeling of, of relief. Hmm. And I know, you know, you don't just stay in Spain either. Obviously you are, you're traveling all over the place and you kind of have this, you know, this persona of being a traveling musician and, and fitting into a bunch of different cultures. And so I was curious, number one, like what are some of the coolest things that you've done uh, while traveling, doing music and how can other musicians that have that desire, that wanderlust to, to do their music all over the place and combine it with travel, how can they get into those things? Yeah. Well, this is just such a joy to be able to just go into a situation, a musical situation in another culture and, and, and just see what happens. I, I had the most incredible experience once in, in Southern Morocco. Um, long story why I was there, but um, well, actually I was at a wedding, but I, I had the opportunity to, to, um, to play with some Berber tribesmen who have a, a five note scale in their musical repertoire. And um, so this was really interesting because first of all, I was a woman. Second of all, uh, I was a foreigner. Uh, third, there was no common language. Um, they spoke uh, Berber and Arabic and I speak English and Spanish. And, um, and so, you know, and, and so there was just like all of these opposing elements, yet there was this common thread, which was this love of um, creation uh, through music. So I had a guitar <laughs> with me and I just started singing one of my own songs and they listened and then they repeated the first verse of the song, but using their five note scale. So they basically translated my verse into their musical language and performed my song using a five note scale. And then we would kind of go back and forth like a jam session. You know, I would sing a verse and they would sing a verse in, in their way. And it was just absolutely magical, you know, not having any common uh, culture, common religion, common language, common uh, anything, and just finding this this common um, primal connection through music. And I've had experiences like that before uh, in South, uh, in, in, in um, the South Pacific and Polynesia and, and here in Spain and um, in Malaysia. I, I just, I think to answer the second question, um, how do you find situations like that and, and how do you make them work? First of all, you have to let go of any idea of ego, um, totally forget about what you know, what you don't know. Um, second, I think you have to really um, feel like a privileged guest in their circle. And, um, and third, perhaps really tap into your enthusiasm. I mean, these are things that just come naturally to me because I I get so excited by these kinds of situations that I'm, I just, I just like, oh, let's see what happens. You know, it's, it's really, uh, it's really exciting. Uh, um, and just, you know, really be open, really be open to the process, whatever's happened, have no expectations, no preconceived notions. And, and just know that, you know, genuine smiles and, and open hearts are, are welcome everywhere in every culture. Now, what if they want to you know, get, get some performing, specific performing situations like you did, like performing at, at really cool hotels in other countries or, you know, 
performing on cruise ships and stuff. How do you go about getting into that industry? Um, that's a little bit easier in, in this, well, easier. It's, it's, kind of, that's business. I mean, first of all, obviously you have to have, um, have, uh, the chops to do it. Um, those kinds of gigs require a tremendous uh, amount of repertoire. <laughs> I, mm. I usually go with about 500 songs, you know, people wow. ask for requests. And so you have to, um, you have to have a, a lot of a repertoire. Uh, it really helps to have a great knowledge of the genre of music that you're playing because people will say, Hey, can you play this? Or can you play that? And then if you can talk to them a little bit about, Hey, do you remember this recording of, you know, uh, Frank Sinatra from 1956 or whatever? Oh, you don't have to be in an, an encyclopedia, but um, people really appreciate uh, when you have some knowledge of the music that they want to hear. Because um, we're talking about commercial gigs now, right? So yeah, um, and that really makes it fun for them to kind of reminisce too. I like that yeah. idea. Yeah. And it's like, okay, if you don't know that song, okay, I know another song that's kind of like that from that era. So, um, so my advice, listen to a lot of music from, you know, if it's standards, for example, well, just listen to all the, all the standards, uh, from as many of the greats as you can, um, have a really vast repertoire. And anyway, once, once you have a bunch of standards on, under your belt, it's the rest of them are, are not that difficult to learn if you, if you have a knowledge of, um, of harmony and a good ear. So, um, huge repertoire. Now, actually there are some really good practical skills when it comes to those kinds of gigs. You have to just really have good common sense when it comes to be really courte courteous to people, um, really good manners, um, really nicely dressed. Remember that m music is a lot more visual than we think it is. We, we sometimes focus a lot on the music, but um, your whole presentation and the way that you present yourself is um, the first thing that people see. So, um, and then be punctual, punctual, organized, don't complain, uh, you know, just be a, a cool person to hang out with. And, and then once you have those things going, then obviously you've got to have a good video and a press kit and, um, and, and then just get on the Google and, and, uh, Google, uh, cruise ship agencies <laughs> or, or <laughs> hotel uh, agencies. I mean, there's so many of them now. So, um, and then if, if you live in a place where there are five-star hotels that have uh, music, then just go there directly and, and present what you have and maybe, maybe offer to do a free audition or something like that. Mm, that's some really good advice. So I wanted to talk to you about, I know the first that we met um, was one of the people that worked for the label that you were working under um, sent me your music and I played your music. And recently you told me that there were some issues with that label. And I would love to hear like over the years, have you released your stuff independently? And was this the first time you got involved with the label? I know it didn't work out so well. Um, just give us some idea of, you know, kind of your experience with independent versus label and what kind of advice you have to give in that area. Well, it was the second label deal that I had. Um, so let's see. Thing is, is um, because I spend so much time on my live shows and I'm touring all the time and I don't really... I, I just, I had this new CD out and I was so glad that somebody, you know, this particular label was enthusiastic about um, taking it over and, and, and doing a promotion of it in the United States and, and talking about doing tours there and so on. I thought, oh man, this is great because this takes a load off my shoulders. I, I just want to focus on touring and creating. And um, my mistake was not paying attention to uh, my instincts a little bit and, and not paying attention to the details. I was so glad that somebody just wanted to take over that, that area of business that I, I didn't ask the hard questions. Um, some of the things that I should have done uh, was ask this particular A&R person um, really specific questions about his experience and connections and and because I kind of had a feeling that he didn't know as much as I did you know and I thought no uh. oh, you'll figure it out it'll be great it'll be fine um I should have asked him things like um what tour agents do you work with what promotion what promoters do you actually work with um 
Um, have you gotten sponsorships for any of your artists? Um, do you actually know how royalties work, you know, with streaming and downloads? It's very complicated, you know, the whole world of mm -hmm. royalties and, you know, the difference between mechanicals and, you know, uh, what associations work with what territories. And, you know, I should have asked him all these things, like if he even had a knowledge of that. Um, I should have asked him. Um, if he'd had any licensing placements and what music supervisors he worked with, um, you know, I didn't ask those hard specific questions because I was, I was in a hurry and I was distracted and I was, you know, just glad somebody else was going to maybe take over. Um, so I think, you know, we put so much time and, and our hearts and our souls into our music and, and uh, our music is like uh, like having a child, you know. And would you put your child in the hands of a stranger just, yeah. just because, you know, he's promising to take good care? I know. I mean, you would really check that person out, you know. You'd really check. Okay, I've got to call that out. That is <laughs> like one of the best quotes I've ever heard. Music is like your child. And would you put your child in the hands of a stranger? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just because, okay, he'll take good care while I'm gone, you know, on tour. <laughs> Mm. No, I mean, you really got to check these people out because, you know, anyway, that label, I think, went under. I think at least the part of it, um, the jazz department of that label that had signed me seems no longer to exist. But they they just kind of disappeared. They never returned emails or um, phone calls. They just really disappeared, totally breached the contract on on so many levels. But um, but man, you know, I just, I ha you just, you just, you gotta just do what you can and then just let it go. Cause, uh, you know, it's a life And what happened with you and that CD that was signed to them? Were you then able to use that and promote that outside of the contract since they breached the contract? So here's kind of the, the practical advice and, and, and what I learned from that experience and how I got out of it. I think what their game was is to keep my, my digital sales and not submit any accounting reports I, I for as long as they could kind of get away with it. Um, because by the time I got it back in my hands, I only got it back into my hands by going through uh, their distributor, which I discovered um, was the Orchard. And I only discovered that because they were claiming um, my songs on, on YouTube. So I kind of like just did some detective work and, and ended up contacting them and asking them to take it down from their digital distribution. So they finally did after more than two years. And so now it's mine. So I've kind of just re-released it and just re-promoting it and re put it up, you know, uh, mm. on my through CD baby, you know, and then they, you know, all that. Um, so starting over. So it's like giving rebirth over again. So, yeah. you know, maybe it's okay. And in, in, in the long run, it all works out and, and you'll learn. At least you got it back. Yeah. That's, that's part of it. And, yeah. you know. So I would love to hear actually about what you had to say about the Billboard conference that you went to in Miami. Yeah, because this is something uh, really inter interesting information for everybody in, in music. Um uh, the uh, sort of managing director of uh, sort of the biggest agency that deals with all, I mean, everybody from J-Lo to Meryl Streep. I mean, he's he was a Prince's manager for 10 years. Um, Rob Light is his name. And he had some really th interesting things to say about uh, the future of music business, the music business. So he says that uh, within 10 years, uh, CDs will be obsolete which I guess we probably are suspecting anyway. Um, he thinks that uh, downloads will also be, well, very much diminished or obsolete, that downloads just won't even be important anymore. Um, that streaming, it'll be all about streaming, and that streaming will evolve in ways that we can't even imagine at this point. And then uh, for me, the best news uh, was that... Um, he predicts that the live music scene will continue to grow because there really is no replacement for the live music experience. And that's exciting because um, it's what I most love to do. And, and uh, 
I don't want to lose that, you know. I mean, we've seen so many changes in the music business and it's just, it's so hard to keep up with it all, you know. But the live music experience is is, is really the foundation of it all. And, and if the sort of experts are saying that that's uh, going to be a, a growing phenomenon, that people are going to really still want to have that live music experience, that that's very encouraging. I think one thing too, in this world of social media, we don't have as many personal connections anymore. And I think people really crave that deep down and going to a concert, you know, you really have that personal connection with the person on the stage, even though you're not actually talking to them or, you know, they're not right in front of you, but you, you feel connected to them and that's mm. something you can't get online. Yeah, that's so true. That's so true. And it's a great reason why to really work on your live show as well. Yeah. And I'd love to hear about, I know you have a new show that you created, kind of a program that combines, you know, your stories from your travels with your music. Tell us about that. How did you come up with that idea? And, you know, what kind of places are you performing that at? Well, yeah. So um, <laughs> I have uh, been asked, you know, to, to over the years to sing in different languages and, and something that I enjoy doing just because uh, I've collected a lot of songs on my on my travels. So I put a, a two different shows together, two 45 minute shows where I sing in French, Tahitian, Malay, Portuguese, and do a, a variety of styles and telling some stories um, to connect the, uh, the music. And um, this first kind of came up through a, a show that I was I was doing on a cruise ship in, in, in the theater. And, um, and then it kind of evolved from there. And, and then I, I just got a, a few more bookings for that. So I thought, yeah, this is a great opportunity to, to try this out. Um, did one uh, last month, uh, two concerts of, uh, of this show for, actually it was a corporate event. Um, so it was a slightly different version of the show, but um, I'm going out uh, next week, actually on the on the fifteenth, to to perform the show on a on the Oceana Riviera. It's a cruise ship, and mm. doing the Mediterranean. So um, it'll be fun, and I do it as a soloist, and I'm I'm accompanied by the ship's orchestra. So it's a seven piece band, and so I've got to bring you know really good arrangements for the band, and and uh, you know it's a it's a combination of concert and uh, and entertaining. It's it's like a small sort of music uh, musical theater idea show. It's fun. That's really fun. I always encourage people to come up with program ideas instead of just saying like, oh, I'm a singer songwriter. I do songs. You know, if you can go to people and say, I've got this program, it gives them kind of this compact thing that they can think about and they can promote as a thing instead of just going, oh, I've got this singer that I'm going to put on the stage. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and I just I just thought of this great quote, another quote that I heard at the Billboard Music Conference. Yeah. Somebody said, music sells everything but itself. Mm. Think about that for a second. Music sells everything but itself. So, I mean, some music obviously sells itself, but um, we're just so in inundated now with stuff. Uh, so I think if you can make it relatable and, and, and give it some context, people really take it in better that way. Yeah, that makes total sense. Yeah. So I always ask people at the, near the end of the show, if you have a book that you can recommend either about the business side, about the creative side, or even about maybe self-improvement. Well, yeah. <clears throat> so there is a great book called Effortless Mastery. Effortless Mastery by Kenny Werner, who's a jazz pianist. Um, it is just one of the best books that I have read about, uh, I mean, you can apply it to, to being a, a musician or you can apply it to life, but it really gets back to the why, why you're doing what you're doing. Um, you know, he kind of says, the world really doesn't need another uh, piano player or another singer unless that piano player, that singer is, is really playing from their authentic selves, you know, and it, it talks a little bit about getting your ego out of the way and really just getting really in touch with the whole uh, musical experience. And um, it's just a, a great, very kind of very easy to read and very deep at the same time. Great book. Oh, yeah, that sounds really good. So how can our audience get in touch with you, find out more about you, where you're performing? Um, we have people that listen here from all over the world. So who knows? Maybe they're in the neighborhood where you're going to be performing. Um, what 
are your social media handles and your website? Yeah. So uh, Nancy Ruth dot com. Everything is there. N a n c y r u t h. Nancy Ruth dot com. And uh, on Twitter, my handle is Nancy Ruth. And uh, on Facebook, uh, uh, Nancy Ruth Music. Um, but all the links are there on my contact page of my Nancy Ruth dot com website. Perfect. It has been so great to talk to you. You, I just love talking to people that have been in the business for as long as you have, because you have so much knowledge, experience, and perspective. Thanks, Bree. And I love what you're doing. It's really been a pleasure for me to speak with you. And, and congratulations on, on your many faceted uh, business. It's just, it's just fantastic. Thank you. It's been so great. And I know our listeners will learn a ton from this episode. Thanks, Bree. Now go out and make great music, connect with your fans, and grow your business. Female Entrepreneur Musician has been brought to you by femusician.com and femalemusicianacademy.com. With editing by Jen Eads of 317 Sound Design and music by Stella Ronson.